This is lecture 9-4, which is the beginning of the really challenging stuff in this part of the unit. So um, make sure that you're being really careful as you read and write your learning targets about buffers. Um, we're going to break this into kind of two parts, one which would be what, or three parts really, what is a buffer, um, how do you find the pH of just a buffer, and then how do you find the pH of a buffer if you're using it by adding a strong acid or a strong base. So the foundation in this lecture is really important for what we do when we start doing titrations, which is essentially adding a strong acid or a strong base to um, usually a weak acid or a weak base. We could also add it to a strong, but this is going to be super important. So make sure that you do a really good job on these targets. Stop this if you need to. Um, it's kind of challenging, so be patient. And then restart it when you're ready. Okay, so buffers. Um, a buffer is essentially a solution that has a appreciable quantity of both parts of a conjugate pair, okay? So um, a buffer basically is going to be a solution that has the common ion, meaning the common ion, uh, meaning like let's say I have a weak acid like HF and I put it in water and that's going to form the hydronium ion and F minus. And if all I put into my solution in the beginning is my weak acid, maybe 0.1 molar, then um, there would be zero of both of these. That's just a weak acid. But if you have a solution where you actually have some of the conjugate in there, um, maybe the F minus, and ideally this would be also in 0.1 molar concentration, the same as the weak acid, then that would be what we call a buffer because it has present, um, and really the, where it needs to be present is at equilibrium, but, um, but we want to talk about how we could put them in there and then let this settle out. Okay, so the idea would be that if you have a solution that you start with equal concentrations of both parts of a conjugate, that would be what we call an ideal buffer. The idea of this is that that would mean that I could add a strong acid to this, and if I did, it would react with the weak base, which would be in this case the F minus, and that would stop the pH from plummeting when we add the strong acid, because if we add a strong acid to water, the pH drops drastically and just allow it to drop slightly because what would happen is that it's going to react with the weak base, the F minus, and that's going to um, then take out the F minus in solution and create a situation where Le Chatelier's principle is going to try to replace it. And that will slowly um, make our situation come back closer to equilibrium. So it makes it so that it's a much smaller effect on the pH. If we were to add a strong base to this, then it would react with the weak acid portion, which in this case would be the HF. So you have to picture that if we did this first scenario where we added the strong acid and it reacted with this, it would remove this from, situation, from the situation and the reaction would move to the right to fill it back in. Um, and if we did the strong base and it reacts with the HF, that's going to remove this from solution and the reaction would move to the left. So um, basically what happens is that we end up kind of using up the strong um, and, and creating this equilibrium scenario, okay? So this is kind of confusing until you really dive into it. Um, there is something that I want to talk about with you before we start doing the calculations, is that a buffer must contain significant amounts of both parts. Um, technically, you would maybe have a buffer that would only need to react with a strong acid and not a strong base, or you might have a buffer that would need to react with a strong base and not a strong acid, but most buffers are designed for a situation that in which either could occur. So at that point, um, like in your blood, your blood needs to buffer that pH back to a pretty close to what the blood's pH already was, whether the situation becomes more acidic or more basic. And so we like to think about buffers having equal parts or very close to equal parts of both um, parts of the conjugate pair. Okay, so long story short, there are two different ways to make a buffer. Um, the, and you should have encountered this kind of at the end of your learning targets here, right? So what I've just talked about kind of gives you um, this initial piece, okay? 
here. It doesn't really talk about the math, but talks about that. And we'll talk about the math in a second. And now we're going to talk about the ways that you would make a buffer. And remember that your goal is to have, when you're finished, significant amounts of both parts of a conjugate pair. So the easiest way to do this is to make a solution with a conjugate pair present from the start. This would be physically add those two ions together. So this might be a solution that you create by adding the salt of the conjugate base to a weak acid. In other words, um, they're not really reacting with each other. You're creating the common ion situation. So this might be I have HF and I might add sodium fluoride. I put this plus sign here, but it's not really a reaction. You need to picture that those two things are not going to react. So it's easier to picture this as your buffer being a situation where instead of having that as a plus sign, it's composed of those two things. And then you can picture that it would be this ice chart that I have here. Or you could add the soluble salt of, sorry, um, the conjugate acid to a weak base. So maybe this would be like the weak base ammonia and I add the salt ammonium chloride because the conjugate acid of this weak base is ammonium. So you want to really be looking for conjugate pairs and if you see a situation where you're putting in the salt of the conjugate of your weak acid or your weak base, you are creating a buffer just by putting those two things in the container together because you're creating that common ion situation. This is the easiest way to make a buffer and the easiest to identify. But there's also the scenario where you might be adding, um, starting with a weak base and neutralizing part of it with a strong base. So if we come back and look at kind of the reaction that might be happening, let's say I have... Um, one mole of HF, and I add to it 0.5 moles of, um, this is a weak acid, so let's add hydroxide, maybe sodium hydroxide, okay? If I do that, when I react the HF and the OH minus, I'm going to get this transfer of hydrogen to the hydroxide, and I'm going to get water, and I'm going to get F minus because that will be what's left behind. So what you have to picture is that this is a limiting reactant scenario. And as long as your strong acid or your strong base that you're adding to your weak um, base or your weak acid is the limiting reactant, then what will happen is that it's going to run out. We're going to use 0 0.5 in the process. We're going to use 0 0.5 and we're going to create, we had none of this to start with, but we're going to create 0.5 moles of this. All right. At that point, this would be 1 mole minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. This would be 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 is 0. And this would be 0 plus 0 0.5 would be 0.5 moles. And what I have in my container is HF and F minus. So I've created a buffer. All right. So the key part of this is that if you're going to add a small amount of a strong acid to a weak base, the strong acid has to be the limiting reactant that causes the formation of significant amounts of both parts of the conjugate pair. Or you could add a small amount of a strong base to a weak acid, that would be what I did here, um, so that the strong base is the limiting reactant. And what you just saw here is really what your book calls ICF, but I would rather call BCA, which is, sorry, it's kind of in the way here, which would be BCA, which is a limiting reactant, <laughs> Sorry, I keep doing that. A limiting reactant scenario and stands for before, change, after. And because it's a limiting reactant, the one that has fewer moles was this one. We're going to use all of it. The coefficients are one to one. In the process, we're going to use the same amount of what's on the same side of the arrow, and we're going to produce the same amount of what's on the other side of the arrow. So I'll do this again with you, but this is kind of an introduction to everything that you have, right? So now the easiest way to decide what's in your solution, if you have, uh, especially if you have an acid-base reaction. So what I wrote here was weak plus strong. So this could be weak base plus strong acid, or this could be weak acid plus strong base. And the easiest way to do this is in your stoichiometry um, using a before change after chart. So that's what I had here, it was kind of messy. Um, you can do it in moles or you can do it in molarity, but you have to make sure that you're combining volumes if you do molarity. So that's really important and often it's easier to do moles. All right. So I will often do BCA in moles, but do ice in molarity.
and this requires some going back and forth between the two, but I think it's easier for you. So you know that you need to use this. If one of your reactants is strong, um, then you have a one-ray reaction, which is not equilibrium. It's a limiting reactant situation, and you're going to use B, C, A. If you don't have anything that's strong, so like up here where I put in the conjugate pair, I had two weak conjugates. Because of that, I'm not creating a one-way reaction. I'm creating an equilibrium system, and I'm actually putting in something from each side of the equilibrium, the reactants and the products. So this one right here is definitely um, a little more tricky, and we have to talk about how to do it. If you're going to do a BCA chart, you write the equation for the reaction, which would be the reaction between the strong and the weak, one way. You're going to use volume in liters, so if you're given milliliters, make sure you use liters, times molarity equals moles. This is um, the dimensional analysis. It's just easier to kind of fast to do it this way. So kind of think about that, that V times M, as long as you are in liters, gives you moles. Or if you really want to do this combining volumes thing, then you're going to find VM, VM for both reactants and find the new molarities, and then you can do that. Okay, so then you're going to put the given moles in the before line, and these will both be on the reactant side. Neither one of those would be on the product side. Okay, and um, well, later they might be, but for right now they won't be. Actually, I'm going to take that back because I don't want to confuse you later. So you're going to put in your given moles of what you have in the before line, and then you're going to decide which will run out. Um, and which way this reaction will go. If there's a zero, it has to go toward the zero, um, but typically these are one-way reactions, and so they often go left to right, and the coefficient ratio is always one-to-one, -one, so the one with fewer moles is going to be the one that runs out, and in the change line, subtract all of the limiting reactant from itself and from the other reactant and add it to the products in that same amount. And then do what you would do in an ice chart and combine the first, the B line and the C line to give you your after line, okay? So here's an example that will kind of get you started. And it's already worked out. So if you need to stop the video um, to get it written down in a minute, you may want to do that. But let's say we're going to add sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base, to hydrofluoric acid, which is a weak acid, okay? I'm going to put them together. And the minute I see a strong here, I think one way. So this is a one-way reaction. So I want to write the net ionic equation, HF, and remember that sodium is always soluble, so plus OH minus, and the H will transfer. It's better not to write that unless you have to, so um, if you need to, write it, but otherwise just picture that the H will transfer. Give me water and F minus. And um, so now I have my equation, which would be the same as what's down here, just in a different order, okay? So um, the next thing that I want to do is find the moles of everybody who's in the container. So I have moles of OH minus that I care about, and I have moles of HF that I care about. Remember that the weak acid stays together and does not ionize. This is really important. So then you're going to do volume times molarity. So I have 25 milliliters. Oh, this was a mistake. Um, this should be 0 0.025 liters. 25 milliliters. Let me just make sure that my moles are right really quickly. Um, so 0 0.025 times 0 0.005, oops, sorry, 0 0.025 times 0 0.2 is 0 0.005. Okay, so this is the only mistake. This should be 0 0.025 liters times 0 0.2 molar gives me 0 0.005 moles of OH minus. And the 50 milliliters, which is 0 0.050 liters of 0 0.2 molar HF, gives me 0 0.010 moles of HF. So these go in the B line of my chart. So I put in my two numbers of moles, all right? And I don't have any fluoride ion because I didn't put any in. So this is before anything occurs. Notice that of these, I have fewer moles of OH minus, so it will be the limiting reactant. They're going to react in a one-to-one -one scenario. So that means in my change line, I'm going to subtract all of my limiting reactant, which would be 0 0.005 moles. When it reacts, it's going to take with it point, the same amount, so 0 0.005 moles of HF, and it's going to form, as it comes this direction, the same amount, because the coefficient over there is also a one, so because these are all the same, 
Now I'm going to form 0 0.005 moles of F minus. Remember, I'm ignoring the water because it's a liquid. And that means that I can see at the end that I have no hydroxide ion left, but I have HF and I have F minus. And what I have here is actually equal amounts of the buffer of a weak base and a um, weak acid. And so I have a pH that's going to be equal to pKa. And so we'll talk about how to find that in a second. But this is equal molar solution of a buffer of the two conjugate pairs. Okay. Um, it's really conjugate acid weak base or but weak acid conjugate base, but that's okay. So we'll talk about the calculations in a second using the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. All right, so let's see what's happening. To determine the pH of a buffer solution alone. So let's say up here, this buffer that I created here, I want to know what the pH is. Okay, or the buffer solution here alone, just the HF and the F minus, then um, I'm not yet going to do this. We haven't done it, but when I'm adding a strong acid or a strong base to the buffer, we haven't done that yet. I only added a strong base to my weak acid, not to my buffer. Okay, so we're going to use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. This is super important. It comes in a basic form also, but I really just always use this because remember that Ka equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14th over Kb of the conjugate. Okay, and so let's say you were given the base form and you were given Kb, you can find Ka really easily. All right. Also remember that pKa is equal to the negative log of Ka. All right. So this is really easy, and that's because it treats this as a ratio. So at this point, if you're given molarities of your buffer after they're mixed, sometimes they do this to you, and they tell you a solution has a molarity of this and this together. That means after they're mixed, then you have it already in the ratio, and the volume doesn't matter because the volume is the same in both parts, right? Or you can do this in moles. So you want your units of your conjugates to be in either molarities or in moles. And if you're given molarity, that's easier. If not, it's usually easier to use moles than to go back and find new molarities. Okay? So if it's just the buffer, which is what we're talking about right now, you only need the molarity or the moles of the conjugate base and the weak acid that are present. If those conjugates are equal, it's a perfect buffer, and that would mean that this ratio right here equals 1, and the log of 1 equals 0, and so pH would equal pKa, all right? So if the conjugate are present in equal concentrations, then this is really easy because pH equals pKa. Um, if not, maybe you have more of the weak acid, then the pH will, pH will be lower than the pKa, and if you have more of the weak base, then the pH will be higher than the pKa. And you can either use the theory to estimate, like, oh, if they just ask, what will the pH be, and you can kind of estimate by the ratio how much higher, or you can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch in the free response to calculate it exactly. So you always want this equation to be in your head, because this is really important to buffer calculations. All right? Um, if you're going to add a buffer, or add, sorry, a strong acid or a strong base to a buffer, you have to first do what I did a second ago and use your um, one-way equation. The trick will be is that you have to make sure that you have both the conjugate acid and base present before you do your BCA. So let's say we have this, and I'll show you for real in a minute. Um, Let's say we're adding OH minus to our buffer, and our buffer was this, all right? And we're adding OH, so our buffer was HF and F minus, and we're adding OH minus to it. So OH minus reacts with the weak acid. So this would be my one-way equation. Sorry, this should not be an, a double arrow. This should be a one-way arrow, all right? And I'm going to do BCA. If this is a buffer, there's an initial amount of HF and an initial amount of, I minus, of F minus. And then I'm going to add whatever initial amount of the OH minus to it. So as long as what I add of the OH minus is limiting, then my buffer will still work. And this is what we call buffer capacity. All right, it's the number of moles of strong acid or strong base that the buffer could absorb before the buffer becomes the limiting reactant. 
okay? And so you can determine the capacity by finding the number of moles of each of the conjugates. If you were to add more of the OH minus, let's say this was a really large quantity of OH minus, then you would end up with excess OH minus and your HF would be the limiting reactant and completely gone, okay? And then you've ruined your buffer. So this then at that point, the pH is gonna come just from the excess OH minus and I'll talk with that. I'll talk with you about how to do that um, in a few minutes, so that we can kind of see what's happening with that. Okay, but this is your pattern, and you may need to keep coming back to this um, so that you can see it. So these two slides right here that I really made a huge mess out of are really important. So I'm gonna do this and um, make it. I will perhaps post this lecture for you so that you can come back and find it. If you want to, um, all you got to do is ask. But these two slides right here are kind of your how-to. All right. So let's do a, a problem. And this is going to be a long lecture. I'm sorry. But we're going to do a problem so that you can kind of see what's happening. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to do is give you a frame of reference. So I want the pH of pure water. And at this point, the volume is irrelevant because if it's pure water, um, we don't really care. All right. But you could say that pure water at 25 degrees Celsius has a pH of 7. But they want you to explain or justify. So this is because of the auto ionization of water, right? If you needed to prove it, you would do 2H2O gives you H3O plus plus OH minus. This is a liquid, so you don't care. These both add X. So basically what we have here is KW is 1 times 10 to the negative 14th equals X squared. So X equals 1 times 10 to the negative 7th. And to find pH, we could say that equals the hydronium ion. And then pH would be the negative log of that, which would give us 7.0 and with one sig fig right? So you can walk your way through this if you need to, but you can say because of the auto ionization of water and KW at 25 degrees Celsius, water has a pH of 7.0, all right? Now, we want to know what would happen to this if we add 0.1 milliliters of 12 molar hydrochloric acid. So at this point now, there's nothing in my water to react with hydrochloric acid. So when I put this in, um, it's not going to be a reaction. It's just going to dissociate. So I need to figure out how many moles I'm adding. And they tell me that the volume doesn't change. It really would change by that one-tenth of a milliliter, but that's past our significant figures um, when we're only good to the whole number of milliliters. So it's irrelevant that we're going to add that 0.1 milliliters. All right. So the first thing I need to do is find moles of the strong acid added, okay? So I'm gonna do this with doing volume times molarity. The volume has to be in liters. So that would be 0 0.00, if I'm gonna move this three places, 0 0.00010 liters times the 12 molar, okay? And this gives me um, 0 0.0012 moles of HCl. And remember, you should always check about one mole of HCl has one mole of H plus ions, which when I put them in water will create one mole of hydronium ions. And so I have 0 0.0012 molar hydronium. Okay, I'm not going to write that equation, but remember that when you put hydrogen ions in water, they're going to attach and make the hydronium. All right, so at this point now, I want the pH of this, so it's going to be the negative log of my hydronium concentration, which will be then, um, oh, sorry, I'm not, I need to fix this. This is just moles, and I caught myself, I'm sorry. This is 0 0.0012 moles. I wrote moles there. I need to know molarity because pH is the negative log of the hydronium concentration, so the concentration would be the negative log of 0 0.0012 moles divided by my volume, which is still 100 milliliters. So that would be 0 0.100 liters. And that gives me a pH of 1.9. I have two significant figures. So 1.92 equals pH.
All right, so notice we went from seven of pure water to this teeny tiny little amount of concentrated hydrochloric acid, and the pH dropped all the way to 1.92. All right, let's see what happens if we have a buffer. So first we have to figure out what our buffer is. And this is to introduce you to Henderson Hasselbach. This is a solution composed of 0.2 molar ammonia and 0.2 molar ammonium chloride. So these are um, already mixed. When they word it this way, these concentrations are already mixed. If they give you a volume there, it's irrelevant. Um, if they're already mixed, if it's a solution composed of that. So if you're pouring together these solutions, then you need to use VMVM and find the numolarities. But usually when they do this, they word it such that you already know that they're mixed together. Okay, so at this point, I notice that I have ammonia, which is a weak base, and I have ammonium chloride, which is going to be soluble, and ammonium happens to be the conjugate of the weak base. Okay, so this means because I have an appreciable amount of each of my conjugate pair, I have a buffer. So to find the pH of a buffer, I'm going to use Henderson Hasselbach, and that would be pH equals the negative log of Ka times, which is pKa, remember, so it's worded as pKa sometimes, plus the log of, and this is really important, this has to be weak base over conjugate acid. The base has to be in the numerator. So you're using the Ka, but your conjugate acid goes in the denominator. And the plus the log is because it's minus the negative log, and this is all derived for you somewhere in your book, but it's easier not to show you the derivation. So you just have to trust me. All right, so this is my equation, pH equals the negative log of, I don't know Ka, but I do know Kb for ammonia. So we're going to do 1 times 10 to the negative 14th over the Kb, and that would be the Ka. All right, so I've just taken the, the pKa, or the negative log of the Ka, plus the log of the molarity of the, the weak base, which is the ammonia, so this would be 2.20 molar ammonia over the 0 0.20 molar of the conjugate acid, okay? So clearly we don't need these in here because that's gonna mess us up um, if we look at trying to cancel them, but this was to illustrate to you that it's gotta be the weak base over the conjugate acid. And I actually punch this, this is one of the few times that I do this in my calculator using parentheses, but I do it all at once. Um, in this case, I wouldn't really have to because all of this um, is the log of one, which equals zero, right? So because they're equal, pH equals the negative log of the Ka, or pH equals pKa, and now that means that the pH equals 9.25527. I have two significant figures in my KB and in my concentration, so that's going to be 9.25. All right, so this is my buffer to start. The buffer alone, just the buffer in the beaker, has a pH of 9.25. Notice that it's um, a basic buffer, and so its pH is basic, right? Um, if you had something where your K a is bigger than your KB, then you would have an acidic buffer. So just kind of be aware of that. All right. Okay. So now we want to know how much of the um, strong acid or strong base you could add to this buffer. So to figure out the capacity, this means you need to know the moles of the weak base and the moles of the conjugate acid. Okay. Because the weak base will react with strong acid and the conjugate acid will react with a strong base. All right, so to find the moles of the weak base, I'm gonna use volume times molarity and they tell me that I have, volume times molarity, they tell me I have 100 milliliters, which is 0.1 liters and um, it's 0.2 molar. And so I have 0 0.020 moles of NH3. So this means that technically I could add up to that amount of strong acid and this buffer would still work. Okay, so the capacity, um, the acid capacity for this equals 0 0.020 moles. All right, I could add up to that much of strong acid added.
that's how you want to picture it. The moles of the conjugate acid are going to be the same because in this case, um, we're going to use volume times molarity. It's the same 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters. And the molarity of my conjugate acid is the same at 0.2 molar. 0.200, oh, 0.20, oh, sorry, 0 0.20 molar, which means that I have the same 0 0.020 moles of the weak acid or the conjugate acid, which is ammonium, which means that the base capacity, because if I react, the ammonium is the acid, it would react with a strong base. So the base capacity, capacity, is also 0 0.020 moles of strong base added. If I add more than that, then I'm going to ruin my buffer. All right, so let's do a calculation and I'll show you what I mean by this. You're going to calculate, calculate the pH of 100 milliliters of our buffer. So that means that I'm allowed to do what, um, add as much strong acid or strong base as we calculated here. Uh, but I wouldn't have had to calculate the capacity unless they asked me to. I'll show you why. Okay, if I add 0.1 milliliters of 12 molar hydrochloric acid, so this is a strong acid. And we're going to add a strong acid to our buffer. So this is different than what we did when we added the strong acid to water. Because in water, there's nothing to suck up that strong acid. And so all those hydrogen ions are just going to float around in there. But in our buffer, the strong acid will react with the, the base part, the weak base, of the buffer. All right? And this is going to be a one-way reaction. So our reaction that's going to happen will be our weak base along with the H plus ions and the strong acid that we're adding. And this is kind of doesn't look like Bronsted-Lowry. This is weird, but you have to picture that the H plus is going to attach itself to the ammonia and give you NH4 plus. So this is a one way reaction. Remember that we'd have the chlorines in there from the ammonium chloride and from the hydrochloric acid, but that's always soluble. So this is a net ionic equation. All right. We're going to do BCA with this. So what we need to know is that at the beginning, when we started this, we figured out that we had 0 0.020 moles of NH3. And if you hadn't figured that out yet, you'd have to figure that out like we did up here. And we have 0 0.020 moles of NH4+. And those are just sitting in, so notice that I've done this in moles. That's really important. These are just sitting in here in our buffer solution. And somebody dumps in hydrochloric acid, and now that's going to change what's happening. So we already figured this out, but remember that the moles of H+, plus, in this case because hydrochloric is 1 to 1, um, will be volume times molarity. So this is, move that decimal three places, 0 0.00010 liters times 12 molar. And that gives us um, 0.0012 moles of H plus in our hydrochloric acid. Okay, so this is how much we're adding in. So that's going to come in here to the initial as 0.0012 moles. All right, so really important that you know that before you start, you need to figure out the moles of the weak base in the buffer. You know that you need to figure out the moles of the conjugate acid in the buffer, all right? That would be this. And then you need to figure out the number of moles of your strong that you're adding, and that would be this, all right? Those are your beginning stages here when you're reacting something with a buffer. When I look at this, they're all one to one to one. So of my two reactants, the one that's gonna run out as the hydrogen ions get sucked up by the ammonia is the one that's smaller, which in this case is the hydrogen. So it's your limiting reactant, which means they're one to one. It's gonna get used up as 0.0012 moles. And when it does that, it's gonna use 0.0012 moles of ammonia, and it's gonna form 0.0012 moles of ammonium. This is limiting reactant, so you know your change line. This is not an unknown X, this is a you know your change line. Okay, so when I'm done, I'm just going to put these two together. So um, here, 0 0.0012 minus 0 0.0012 for the H plus is zero. So I have zero moles of H plus left. I have ammonia, um, 0 0.020 moles minus 0 0.0012, which gives me 0 0.0188. And I'm actually not going to round the sig figs right now um, until I'm all done. Okay, 
unless they ask me for that concentration. And then I'm going to add the 0.0012 moles to the ammonium, which will give me 0.0212 moles. Okay, so this is moles of NH3 in solution, and this is moles of NH4 plus in solution. And now what I notice is that I have a buffer because I have both parts of my conjugate pair in solution. And I have no hydrogen ions left, so they got sucked up by the ammonia. All right, so because I have a buffer, I'm going to use Henderson-Hasselbalch again. So now I'm going to put in um, pH equals the negative log of, if you already did this and you figured out what it was, you could just use it again, but um, I don't mind punching it like this. So um, my KB, K, sorry, this is, I'm looking for KA and my KB was 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. So now that would be the negative log of KA plus the log of the conjugate base, which is the ammonia. And I can do this in moles over moles because even if I figured out um, what the molarity was, picture that each one of them would be moles over 0.1 liters and moles over 0.1 liters, right? And so the 0.1 liters would cancel and they're irrelevant. So this is why I really like Henderson Hasselbach because it saves us finding the concentration, all right? So then I'm going to do plus the log of base, which is 0 0.0188 moles over acid, which is the ammonium, which is 0.0212 moles. And now I can punch all that in my calculator to discover that the pH is 9.20309, some more numbers. I see two significant figures um, in what I was given. If I were to round um, my in my K, I was given to, if I were to round my addition and subtraction in my BCA chart, it would have to round to the third place after the decimal, which would give me two sig figs. So I have two sig figs. So that means that my pH is now 9.20. So the next thing that we look at then is comparison. In adding the buffer, right, when we added our same exact amount of hydrochloric acid to water and to the buffer, the buffer went from 9.26, which was the pH of the buffer all by itself up here, oh, sorry, 9.25, went from 9.25, which was the pH of the buffer. And after it used up those hydrogen ions, its pH was 9.20. So this was a difference of um, only 0.05 in pH. This is after we added the H plus and they reacted. Okay. And so this is a very small pH change. This is, was a very acceptable range of pH change, but in the water, in the first example, it started out at 7.0 when it was just water and it dropped to, I think 1.92 when it was after adding the H plus, right? And this is because there was nothing to react with it, so it dissociated and floated around free. So remember that a buffer is there to suck up the strong acid or the strong base and not allow it to change the pH by just dissociating and floating around. All right? That's the big idea of a buffer. Finally, I know this is long, but I'm going to show you one more example. We're going to do this again, and now I want to add hydroxide so that you can see how that will change your reaction. And I also want to add more than I'm able to add, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is picture that my original buffer was NH3 and NH4+. And um, I already know that I had 0 0.020 moles of each because I already figured that out. So this is my original buffer. I'm not going to go back and do that work again. And now I've told you we're adding 0.025 moles of sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. So the first decision is strong base reacts with the weak acid part of the buffer. All right. So the weak acid is the ammonium. I need to write my one way equation. So NH4 plus plus OH minus. And now I can treat this like Bronsted Lowry. The H plus will transfer. So that's going to give me NH3 plus H2O, okay? So this is my one-way equation for the reaction with the buffer and the strong base. This is always your first step. If you're adding a strong, you have to figure out how what happens after it reacts.
So we're going to do BCA, which means it needs to be in moles. All right. I'm going to put in the moles of my buffer. So that was 0 0.020 moles of ammonium and 0 0.020 moles of NH3 ammonia. And I'm going to ignore the water because it's a liquid. And then they told me I added 0 0.0250 moles of OH minus. Okay. So because I did that now, I'm going to evaluate my limiting reactant and see that my NH4 plus is smaller. So it's the limiting reactant. All right, that means I'm using up all of my limiting reactant, which will be 0 0.020 moles subtracted. That leaves me with no ammonium left. I'm going to use up the same amount because they're 1 to 1 to 1 here. I'm going to use up the same amount, the 0 0.020 moles of OH minus, which after I subtract leaves me with 0 0.005 moles of OH minus remaining. Okay. And then I would form that same 0 0.020 moles of ammonia, which would give me 0 0.040 moles of ammonia, all right? But the fun part of this is, is that because of the strong base in solution, this ammonia can't really produce more, all right? I need you to picture that if I had this as ammonia left without the ammonium in there, and there was hydroxide sitting there. If this ammonia tries to do the reverse of the reaction that you see here, which is what ammonia would do in water, ammonia plus water yields um, ammonium plus hydroxide, right? So if I were gonna try to do this and I had a whole bunch, 0 0.005 moles of hydroxide sitting there and 0 0.040 moles of ammonia sitting there, if and this is a zero, it's gonna try to go to the right, but this common ion is gonna prevent it from doing so by much. So the good news is, is if your strong um, base is left or if your strong acid is left, in this case we added strong base, is um, in other words, not really, if strong base is left, not the limiting reactant, then you can ignore the weak acid or weak base that would also be present, okay? It's just gonna add a little bit to the pH, but it's not gonna add enough that we can care because of our significant figures, okay? So this means that to find the molarity, I need to, or to find the pH, I need to do from only the strong base. All right, so you already know how to do this, but I, that means that I need the molarity of hydroxide so that I can find the pOH and then find the pH, okay? So I know how many moles of hydroxide, that would be 0 0.005 moles, and actually, um, I think sig fig-wise, I really only have that one significant figure, O2O, oh, oh no, um, yeah, I have one significant figure, okay? So this is 0 0.005 moles left, and that's what I'm gonna focus on, and it's sitting in 100 milliliters, the volume change was negligible because we added a solid, so this is good, oops, sorry, this is gonna be a molarity of 0 0.05 molar, all right? And um, I'm fairly certain that's three places after the decimal. I can't go any farther than that, okay? So, um, so that means that I'm looking at one significant figure, all right? So this is my molarity of my hydroxide. And then the pOH would be the negative log of the molarity of the hydroxide, which would then be um, pOH of 1.3010. I'm not going to round yet. pH would be 14 minus pOH, right? Okay, so this would be pH equals 14 minus 1.3010, a bunch of numbers, which then equals 12.7, um, 12.7 because I have only one significant figure, so I have to stop there, all right? So notice, look what happened. Even this teeny tiny little 0 0.005 moles of OH minus extra were enough to send my pH from where it was up here at 
right? 9.25 in the buffer all the way up to 12.7. So this is what we call breaking our buffer, all right? And that would be because your buffer was the limiting reactant. So I know this is hard. We're gonna work really hard on this in class. Um, if you need to really think about rewatching this video, you may not wanna do it yet, but you may need to do it again after class. Um, and I think we talked about everything that was in the learning targets. All of these, um, oh, I guess I didn't quite, right? But the most effective is, we talked about that, is equal, equal ratio, so one to one. Um, and the range of that is gonna be reflected that um, basically we can go one, it's not gonna be effective if we go more than one factor of 10 either direction in that ratio. So the, an effective buffer has a pH range of plus or minus one from its pKa, all right? Because if this, if in Henderson-Hasselbalch, I'll show you Henderson-Hasselbalch again. If it's in Henderson-Hasselbalch, this ratio right here is one tenth over one or one over one tenth. That's about as far as you can go and have this buffer actually be productive. So a factor of 10 means a difference of pH of one, right? So your pH, and this is the way you can do multiple choice with this, is that if you um, have a buffer and you're not breaking the buffer by what you add, it should stay within a range of plus or minus one from its pKa, all right? Wow, this is a lot of information. So let's work together really hard in class as we do this.